I mean, yes, you do add certain flavors at the still, so to speak, creation through the not direct fire, perhaps. But for the most part, it's a subtractive process. Mm -hmm. And so that means you should start with a good, that you should have really a small amount of things that aren't good and really make sure that you've got all the components you need. You know, the, the whiskey in many respects is made in the fermenter. It's made, I mean, so much is fixed by the time you use the still for the first time. So many things are either never going to happen or can never be fixed. Mm -hmm. the, the stills that, that I made are a little unusual. I mean, but in, in most respects, they're a traditional pot still. But you made uh, the still. Yes. Um, you know, it, funny longer story, but in brief, I didn't intend to. I had intentions to, it's kind of like the classic car you get. You know, you're just going to change the transmission. Everything will be fine. It's going to be great. And five years later, in a great deal of money, you've kept a quarter panel and a radio. <laughs> that's, that's sort of the, the, the best way to describe, but yes. Um, and that actually was a very good thing um, because, of course, once you get into all of that and you learn what you need to learn to work copper, to weld copper, etc., then really you can do as you like, you know, because if you want a condenser that's got a helical coil, you make a condenser that's got a helical coil. And whether or not somebody wants to build that for you is a material because you can build it yourself. Mm -hmm. That's, for instance, that's actually a key part of our distillation setup, in part because our cold water can get close to 90 degrees in the summer. So we need a great deal of efficiency in the heat transfer. So rather yeah. than having, I'm sure you've seen the standard shell and tube condensers, right, just right, right. pipes full of water inside of a shell that's collecting, condensing the liquid or the vapor. Mm -hmm. um, ours are actually uh, helical coils that go up like that. And as a result of that, it acts much more like a worm than a typical shell and tube because it stays hot in there for a long time till the very end. Mm, so tremendous got, amount of copper content. You've got, you've got the interest of the, of the coil, but with the efficiency of exactly. the shell. And tube. Exactly. So that gives, of course, a very fine but also oily, rich spirit. So, but while that's unusual, to answer your question, I mean, it's fairly typical. So we'll go in at, you know, say 8% alcohol. We'll run low wines off that on their own might come in between 22 and 24 percent alcohol. Mm -hmm. Along with the heads and tails, which we take off and put back in the tank, we have 25 to 27 percent alcohol, depending on what we're looking at, maybe 28. Never more than 28. Okay. Another key, key thing yeah. that is sometimes overlooked. Many people will say 30 anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, it does matter in this respect, since we're making such a rich, full whiskey. Those low wines, as I'm sure you know, the, the, the first distillate or the product of the first distillation, um, you can physically separate out a lot of those fusel oils and things that you don't want mm -hmm. by simply having the alcohol content of the fusel, uh, the uh, low wines correct. So then a traditional second pot distillation. So maybe mid 70s for the first cut, mm -hmm. uh, low 60s for the second cut, you okay. know, which isn't that unusual. Right. Um, one thing that might be a little unusual is that those numbers will change a little bit. So I'm actually there at the stills. Many traditional distilleries will have, you know, cut numbers. The stillman has a cut number and you cut here and you cut there and that's, that's what you do. Without nose and, and so on. <clears throat> exactly. And so nosing and adjusting heat as we go along is, is a critical part of the uh, process. So you go, you go by what that batch is bringing in. Exactly. And how different it might be from another one. And how that particular day, because not only little variations in the low lines alcohol, uh, content, but also, of course, just what's going on that day. How warm is it in the distillery? It's going to mm -hmm. affect the way the reflux right, right. and stills acts. So you may need to adjust. Chip, <coughs> we, we need to taste. Let's taste. At some point. But, Let's do it. But if we've got to taste two only, right? Um, what do we want to taste? Well, it's a, it's it's kind of a tough call. Yeah, I mean, um, you, you've got to love them all. I do. I do love them all. Um, in terms of perhaps where, where I know a lot of your passion is, uh, I'll, I'll pick one and I'll let you choose between the other two. Okay. Uh, so again, we do love them all. I think the malt is something that you should definitely um, try. Uh, these, this is more, this isn't a brandy per se, but this is the Rumble Cask Reserve, which is mm -hmm. quite interesting. Um, perhaps a particular interest that's just out, this is something we release one barrel of every other year. So. We just released a few hundred bottles into New York now. So you've so got to wake up early. It is something that if you want to get, you know, you may not want, but if you want it, you should get it now. <laughs> um, so again, this is the malt. Um, 
we're going to tip every bottling will be a bit different. Um, almost always you're going to see it between 50 and 53, more or less. Um, we do use actually some French brandy methods in this in terms of um, slowly proofing down the whiskey toward the end. There's, right. I, love, I love the fruit character we get in the malt. And so if you add a tremendous amount of water, mm -hmm. uh, you can shock some of that out. If you go very slowly, very slowly, you can super saturate it. And so we try to do that with, with this whiskey in particular. Well, I'll tell you that um, it's not that often, but we encounter that problem mm -hmm. quite a few times. Mm -hmm. What you can tell, mm -hmm. also because sometimes we've, we've had samples before reduction. Mm -hmm. uh, a month later, we've got the bottles, mm -hmm. and there's a lack of, of harmony there. Right. And when you went down in proof, right. you're losing it, and the, the, the whiskey is dismembered. That can happen a lot, and that's, and that's one of the reasons that, you know, it's, it's a hard thing. So, for instance, in this, rather than releasing this at, at maybe a full cask proof um, of 58-59, that's not really something that a drinker can do, slowly proof down their dram over the course of six months. No, not really. So that's why we do that in barrel to let the whiskey kind of come into harmony. And, you know, we'll, we'll put the last little bit in the tank, but we're sort of taking it down as we go. And of course, you can add some in your in your glass. We do the cast strength as well, but there's a bit of kind of a almost a, a blooming. It's 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 good to see the the drama of it, but sometimes if you want it more integrated, that's why we do this one for you. You know, right. so where are you getting the grain from on this one? This particular one, um, it is actually a uh, Northern England Scot Scottish grain, it's Golden okay. Promise. Um, there are many other good malts, but I just I've enjoyed that malt for a long time as a brewer and now as a distiller and so. That's because you, you, you started drinking your single malt in the 80s. And I guess so. I in a blind tasting, this mm. single malt mm. um, would be comparable to, to a um, single malt scotch? Uh, Probably or most similar to a single malt scotch. I mean, kind of back to the point I made about the distinctiveness of Texas whiskey, of course, in some ways there's nothing new under the sun. But the different ways in which you combine those things can be new in that sense. So I think that you're going to get sort of a warm wood character that is more than you're going to get in any mm -hmm. scotch just because they're always using second fill wood. Now, that said, well, all of our wood that we buy is first fill. When it comes to us, those barrels are used two, three, sometimes four times to, to sort of balance the, right. the new oak right. influence and so forth. But <clears throat> Probably most similar to, in, in many ways, to some of the sherried um, highlands, yeah, right? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And there is know, de there is definitely some something to. Right, and I think it is. You know, some of it is the little bit of European oak. You're using European oak. A there. little bit, yeah. I think actually more of it has to do with the traditional coopering practices, that is often and sometimes. Only used with, with the seasoning of the wood, with the with the, of the wood. with the not the sewing, but the well uh, the splitting or we're, the, most of it, it. That just depends on the variety. So there's actually you know again I'm just for the audience, French oak is split that way. There's a difference in the structure of French oak, where if you don't split it, simply put it a leak. Mm -hmm. It's not it's not the better way to do it. It's the only way to do it with French oak. Right. Whereas with uh, European and so, you know, Quercus Robur and the Quercus Alba, the American oak, you can saw it. So they are saw, saw it stays, obviously, except for the French barrels that we use. But I mean, more particularly, the um, stave thickness, fire bending staves versus using steam, keep saying the full yard aging, uh, drying, and curing of wood is not the same thing. Mm -hmm. One involves the other, but they are not interchangeable. Yeah, yeah. And you know that sort of breakdown in the structure of the wood that allows the whiskey to really get fairly deep into the wood is critical for us. And it's also very interesting, you know, I've had conversations with Scottish distillers that, um, I don't want to say envious, because that's, you know, obviously, Glenfiddich is envious of anything that is going on at Balcones, but it's interesting to talk about how I can buy any barrel I like. I don't need to work with someone to age something else in it first. Of course, that works very well. I can just buy it. Mm -hmm. and, and you're not and you're not sound. bound by any uh, by any sort of 
um, American Whiskey Association that would tell you no, you can't do that. Um, Only if you're making, you know, there are there are certain government regulations of course. about that, but you know, the constraints are most strict when it comes to bourbon, which is an excellent thing. We're not actually making bourbon, so we work with it in the constraints, but you know, there isn't just one barrel that is used in terms of any one of these things will have been in multiple barrels through the course of, of maturation. Mm -hmm. um, so, and this, this whiskey included. Well, cheers to cheers. Texas and its, and, it, and its whiskey making. Thank you. It's big. It's a big malt, and you know. So, does that make it make it Texas? I don't know. Probably, but maybe that just makes it more me. I like things that are big and bold, balanced. Hopefully, balanced. But it's it's flavorful and balanced. Mm -hmm. And for example, um, for for uh, an, an American and, and even more so, I guess a Texas mm -hmm. matured single malt, mm -hmm. the nose didn't show any sign of rough. Hot aggressivity at all, right? Right, uh, and we we I'm glad that that's how do you how do you do that? I mean, uh, because you've got that heat. Yeah, I mean, I think again, so much of that really has to go back to the fermentation and distillation. Hmm. You know, if obviously a new make whiskey is not going to be integrated in the way that a mature whiskey should, but if it's hot and rough, then just do it better. <laughs> You know, just just take more care and more time. No, this is this is enlightening because uh, you realize that you it's not just what Mother Nature can give you; it's right. what is available, but what you have to do in order to you tweak work with it. The constraints, right? Yeah. So fighting the heat for us would be so futile, you know. But at the same time, we don't just do the same thing everyone else does only in the heat. That mm -hmm. may not come out so well. I try to focus and say, okay, this is part of who we are, where we are, what we're about. How best do we make our whiskey in terms of, yes, both what I want and flavor profile, but what's going to work well? One thing that's probably most unique about Texas aging as opposed to, uh, say, Caribbean, you know, so you've got the Caribbean, which is kind of hot all the time. And so I'm overgeneralizing, but even the Caribbean winter is not exactly mm. cold. Mm. Scotland, you know, there's, there's colder wet and colder wet. <laughs> Too oversimplify. Texas, we have not cold, cold winters, but it'll be 40 degrees, 45 degrees. All right. Winter. So, you, and regardless, you have you have strengths. temperature variation. We do, and that's really key because on the one hand, we do want the really full, hopefully not overly aggressive oak extraction and so forth. On the other, those cool temperatures are critical for the for the fruit, for the ester formation that mm -hmm. you get in the spirit. It's very hard to really bring out the fruit the way you would like if you don't have any colder temperatures in your program. Right. Viewers who are not extremely familiar with Texas, mm. um, where is the distillery exactly? We're basically right in between. If you draw a line between Dallas and Austin, we're basically right in between in Waco. Okay. Yeah. Can people go in and visit your Definitely, distillery? Definitely, yeah. We, we do tours by appointment. Um, we just want to make sure there's someone there, typically me, sometimes other distillers, to take the time to show people around. But yes. Lovely. Great. Well, uh, Balkanis is certainly a, uh, a different one. Hmm. Uh, should I say progressive? How do you describe yourself? Um, I would say uh, perhaps progressive novelty, but not for the sake of novelty. We are trying to do something new, and so hopefully that'll stick and contribute something positive. Cheers to Cheers. that. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Please.